Good evening, glad that you guys are here with us tonight. Uh, once you guys, well, while you're turning to Numbers 20, uh, I want you guys to be praying for Pierce, Micah, and myself. We have a meeting this week. As you know, we've been looking uh, for the last few months for a place where we can meet and kind of have as our own so we can meet Sunday mornings and have our own space. And, uh, and so we have a meeting Tuesday about a potential place, and uh, we'll keep you posted on that. But please be praying for us, and uh, we just, you know, we want God to be honored. We're not uh, sad to be here. Like, it's su- super exciting that College Hills lets us use this place, but uh, we are looking for a place, and we have, uh, we have a meeting that we're having Tuesday afternoon. So keep us in, in mind and prayer, and just pray that God would be honored in that. I told you last week that uh, the book of Numbers basically breaks up into three sections. Chapters 1 through 13, you can count it, chapters 1 through 14 if you'd like, covers about, uh, about four or five months. And then chapters 14 through chapters 20 covers 38 years. And then chapters 21 through chum- Numbers 20, wow, Numbers 21 through Numbers 36 covers about six months. And, uh, and this is all part of the 40 years that the people of God are wandering in the wilderness, right? And so the people have been wandering in the wilderness. They've actually been camped out near Mount Sinai for about a year at this point. And you might remember last week in Numbers chapter 10, it tells us that on the, the 20th day of the second month of the second year, so for our intents and purposes, okay, uh, for our understanding of it, the people left Egypt January 15th, year one. That's just so that we can understand it. You understand that they didn't use like our calendar, right? So for our purposes, they left Egypt January 1st, year one. And then in Numbers chapter 10, it tells us that on the 20th day of the second month of the second year, so for our purposes, February 20th, year two, God finally tells the people, leave Mount Sinai. Journey towards the promised land. So they're on the way to the promised land The book of Deuteronomy tells us that's about an 11-day journey, but uh, Miriam gets leprosy on the way, okay? Aaron's sister, Moses and Aaron's sister gets leprosy on the way, and so they camp in one place for seven days, and then you'll remember that when they get to the edge of the river and they send the spies into the promised land, that the spies were in the promised land for 40 days, right? Everybody good? Yes? No? Sort of? Okay. So that means, that means we are somewhere around the end of April, All right, year two, around the end of April, something like that, okay? We can't narrow it down to an exact day, although I have tried, all right? So somewhere around the end of April, year two, and that brings us to Numbers 13, when the spies come out of the land and they say, hey, 10 of the spies say, we can't go into the land. The people there look like giants. We look like grasshoppers. They're going to destroy us. And two spies, um, wow. Joshua, that was gone for a second, and Caleb both say, no, 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 we can go in. We should go in. And so the people rebel against the word of God, and they refuse to go into the promised land. Everybody good? Flip over to Numbers chapter 20, and then we'll come back to the chapters in the middle in just a second. So chapters 13 and 14 occur somewhere around April of year two. Chapter 20, jump to the very end, jump to the very end, and we're going to look at verse... uh, 23 and following, 23 and following. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom. And he said, Aaron will be gathered to his people for he will not enter the land which I have given to the sons of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his sons Eleazar and bring them to Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar. So Aaron will be gathered to his people and will die there. So Moses did as the Lord had commanded, and they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments, his priestly garments, and put them on Eleazar, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. And now Eleazar is going to take over the duties as the priest. Now right there, it doesn't tell us when that occurs. It just tells us that Aaron died, and the people grieved for 30 days. Everybody good still? Okay, hold your finger here and flip over a couple of pages to chapter 31. Sorry, chapter 33. Chapter 33. 
and look at verses 38 and 39. This is recounting their journey, okay? 38 and 39 says, Then Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the command of the Lord, and he died there in the 40th year after the sons of Israel had come up out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. Flip back, please, now to chapter 20. So what day did Aaron die? All right, remember for a moment that I tend more towards teacher than pastor sometimes, so this is kind of like class, but we're not going to stay there for very long. I just want you to see that I'm saying to you, when I say to you 38 years have passed, I don't want you to think I'm making it up, okay? So in Numbers chapter 10, we have a fixed day of the second month, second year. And then in Numbers chapter 20, we have a fixed day of Aaron's death, fifth month, 40th year. Everybody see that? A lot of time has passed, right? So you could say that between chapters 13 and chapter 20, or chapters 14 and chapter 20, 38 years have passed. That's a lot of years that have passed in this, in just a few chapters, agreed? Okay, so now let's go back and look at those few chapters. To recap last week, chapter 13, the spies come out of the promised land and they say, we can't take it. And the people say, all right, we're not going in. Let's go back to Egypt. And then God hands down judgment and says, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the people who disbelieved me, the disbelievers, the doubters, until they are put to death, and then I'll bring your children into the promised land, right? So the day after that, the people go, okay, never mind, we'll go in then. If God's going to kill us in the wilderness, we'll, we'll go in. Instead of wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, we'll take over the promised land. They try to go in the next day, and they're put to death. They're slaughtered. And so that's where we are. Now, chapters 15 through 19, we don't, we don't know the spacing of this. There are no more dates given in those chapters. We don't know how much time passes. But chapter 15 starts to give us a whole bunch of laws. We've already seen laws, right? We've already seen rules, all of Exodus or the end of Exodus, all of Leviticus, the first part of Numbers. Here's more laws. But I want to I show you something. Look at chapter 15, verse 22. When you unwittingly fell, and you do not observe all the commandments which the Lord has spoken to you, even all that the Lord has commanded you through Moses, from the day that the Lord gave the commandment onward throughout your generations, then it shall be, if it is done unintentionally, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all of the congregation shall offer one bull for a burnt offering as a soothing aroma to the Lord, along with its grain offering, a drink offering according to the ordinances, and one male goat for a sin offering. So when the people sin unintentionally, accidentally, you still have four offerings you've got to bring. And the priest has to make atonement for everybody. Look what happens in verse 30. But the person who does anything defiantly, in other words, knowingly violates the law, whether he is a native or an alien among you, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandments, that person shall be completely cut off, and his guilt will be on him. His iniquity will remain on him. So here's, here's what happens. If, in, in fact, this is actually how Leviticus reads. It says when someone sins and they are made aware of their sin, then here's the offering you can bring. So Numbers gives us a little bit more information about that. If you sin and you don't know that it's sin, and somebody points out to you that it's sin, here's all the offerings you have to bring just to be okay. You didn't know, right? You violated something that you weren't even sure about. But what's the penalty if you know that what you're doing is wrong? Banishment from the people of God. Exile. Now, remember, I've been saying for a while, uh, I've been saying for a while that when we read the Old Testament, what we tend to do, what we tend to do is we tend to fold it over on the New Testament and we tend to make applications and say, oh, so when I sin unintentionally, God forgives me. But if I sin deliberately, I'm not a Christian, or God cast me out. I've heard people say that. Anybody ever heard somebody say something like that before? Variations of that? That if you sin intentionally, if you actually, if you actually know that what you're doing is sin, then now you're separated from God. You heard that? That's under the law. I want to clarify something because we've had several people ask these questions. The people in the Old Testament were saved as the same way you and I are saved. Righteousness has always been through faith. Okay? Righteousness does not come through works. Righteousness does not come through law. Now, the book of Ezekiel does say that anyone who upholds the entire law would be righteous through it. 
But what's the catch? No one's upholding the entire law. Right? The book of Hebrews tells us that the law was weak, that the law was powerless, that Moses had said to the people that anyone who lives according to the entire law would be righteous. But no one does that. No one had the ability to do that. Romans 8 says it is because of our flesh, because of our humanity, because of our weakness, our inability, that no one can uphold the law. Romans chapter 4 tells us that Abraham was declared righteous by faith. It's actually Genesis 15 that first tells us that. That Abraham was declared righteous by his faith. And Romans, where Paul is making the case for righteousness through Christ, in Romans chapter 4, Paul says that when, it, when Abraham was told your righteousness has been credited to you as faith, that that wasn't written for his, his sake only, but it was written for all of us who would put our faith in Jesus. Don't make the mistake of thinking that the Old Testament people, even though they were under a covenant of law, don't think that the law was going to save them because it, it couldn't. They were looking forward to the promise of God, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer. And you and I are looking back on the promise of God, the the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer. The object of our faith is the same. That's why Hebrews chapter 11 says that none of these people of faith ever received what was promised, but they saw it from afar, they welcomed it from afar, recognizing that it was the city of God. The end of Hebrews 11 says that they never received it so that apart from this age, they wouldn't be made perfect without us. Because perfection isn't found in the law. Where's perfection found? Where's righteousness found? Where's holiness found? It's found in Jesus. What makes us whole, what makes us complete is Christ. Now the law says, the law says, if you do a sin, but you didn't know it was a sin, here's some ways that you can cover it. When I sin, according to the law, here we are, back in the Old Testament, wandering around in the wilderness. We've been in the wilderness for who knows how many years. And I do something that violates the law, and Micah points it out to me. Now I am obligated by the law to give a burnt offering, and a sin offering, and a grain offering. And the priest is supposed to anoint me. And if it's the whole congregation who sinned unintentionally, then the whole congregation needs to be atoned for. But what happens, what happens to me under the law What happens to me if I sin intentionally? Under the law, I'm banished. I'm cast off from the people of God. Did you know that there are still Christians who teach that way? There are still people who say that you can be cast off from the people of God? The New Testament does say you can quench the Holy Spirit. It warns us to not do that. But if you are in Christ... If you are in Christ by faith, you're righteous, you're holy, you're pleasing to the Father, you're chosen, you're accepted, you're adored by faith, not by law. Be really careful when you're reading the Old Testament that you're not reading it as an analogy of the New Testament. This is not instructional for how we Christians live. This is informative as to how the people of God lived under the law. Here's another common mistake that I think a lot of us make, or at the very least that I made for probably the first 15 years of my preaching ministry, is the answer is 12. There were 12 tribes of Israel, okay? Kind of 13, all right? There's an asterisk next to 12 tribes of Israel because the tribe of Levi wasn't technically counted because the tribe of Levi, those guys would be the priests. Does that make sense? So the people who were doing the sacrifices, the people who were doing the anointing oil, the people who were making, uh, putting, making sure the fire on the altar stayed lit, those guys were the Levites. Everybody good? The Levites had those jobs. The tribe of Judah did not have the job of the priesthood, right? Zebulun didn't, Simeon, Reuben, none of those tribes got to come into the temple of the Lord and offer the sacrifices, only the tribe of Levi. Everybody good? Yes? No? You got it? Tribe of Levi. Okay. Priests. Early on in my ministry, I I would say stuff like, well, people who are in full-time ministry, we're kind of like the tribe of Levi. We get to do the ministry of the Lord. What's the problem with that? Well, there's like a ton of problems with that. One of the problems with that is the idea that only certain people can come in before the Father. One of the problems with that is the idea that only the preacher has a connection to Jesus or that only the preacher has a connection to God. That's not true. 
It's not like Micah and Pierce and I are symbolically Levi and you guys are the other 11 or 12 tribes who, you know, we'll, we'll intercede for you. That's not how it works. Christ is the intercessor for us. Christ is the one who went before the Father. All of us are now brought into the presence of God. But in the Old Testament, only the Levites were allowed to do the work of the temple, and only the high priest once a year was allowed to go into the presence of God. Does that sound like New Testament theology? That only a special person gets to go into the presence of God? No. No. We're ushered into the presence of God through faith, through Jesus. Does that make sense? So when we read stuff like Numbers 15 about unintentional sin and an intentional sin, and here's the penalty for unintentional sin, and here's the penalty for intentional sin, don't start trying to make your New Testament theology based on that. Don't try to develop a system for understanding, well, you know what? When I said that mean thing to that person yesterday, I knew it was a mean thing, so that's intentional sin. Am I banished from the people? Like, don't do that to yourself. Don't hold yourself to the standard of the law when God says that by the law, no man shall be righteous. Please remember that. If you hold yourself to the standard of the law, the result of that is unrighteousness and death. By the law, no one is made righteous. By faith in Jesus, righteousness is received. So don't muddy the water with texts like Numbers 15 and then begin to think that this is Christian application. This is the law, the people under the law who were never going to uphold the law, who still had to put faith in God for righteousness sake, okay? Now, in chapter 16, I do want to point out something. It's a very interesting story. It's, it's probably titled in your Bible, Korah's Rebellion. Moses, key player in the story, right, up to this point from Exodus chapter 2 on, uh, Moses and Aaron are brothers, and they are Levites. And they're the ones who are coming in and out into the very presence of the Lord. They go in, they see the Ark of the Covenant, Uh, They go in to the Holy of Holies. They're kind of in this special place. Moses would go in and meet with the Lord. And when he would come out, his face would be all glowing. And so he'd cover his face with a veil. He'd go in and hang out with the Lord. He did these special things. Well, there are some Levites, the guys who are lighting the fires on the altar, the guys who are playing the trumpets, the guys who are making the oil, the guys who are carrying out all the parts of the offerings that can't be burned on the altar and they're carrying them outside the camp or they're dumping out the ashes. All the other Levites start to get a little bit ticked off that Moses and Aaron seem to have this like authority and power that they don't have. Does that make sense? So the rest of the Levites led, not the rest, but at least 250 of them under the leadership of Korah come to Moses and Aaron. And here are their bold words. They say, Moses and Aaron, you have gone too far. All of the people of God are holy, not just you guys. We should also be doing the things in the temple that you're doing, or at this point, just the tent of meeting. We should also be doing all this. And Moses says, I love that Moses uses the words back to him, and he goes, no, 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 you Levites have gone too far. Is it not enough that God has separated you Levites apart from the rest of the people to do work in his name? He goes, but I'll tell you what. If you really want to be priest, because only Aaron and his sons were priests, if you really want to be priest, show up tomorrow with a golden incense altar and incense in it and bring it before the Lord and we will let God decide who should be the priest. Seems fair. You've got Aaron and you've got 250 other people led by Korah. It feels like the odds are in the favor of the group. And the next morning they show up. And they get their incense bowls and they lay them before God with fire in them. And the Bible says that fire falls from the sky and burns up the 250, leaving Aaron, leaving 250 piles of ashes, I presume, in front of these censers with with, uh, uh, um, an offering in them, and then Aaron over here, like, I don't know, I don't know if, like, Aaron's on this side, and I don't know, I don't know if Aaron's in the mix, just know that if Aaron's in the mix, God doesn't miss, he hit who he meant to hit, and 250 people are burned up, and then Moses tells the, the other people, he says, now go and get those little incense bowls, 
and hammer them out into a thin sheet and put them around the altar as a reminder to everybody else who God picked to be the priest. Just think about that for a minute. Like, this isn't something that, that people aren't going to hear about. Korah and some other people say, hey, Aaron, hey, Moses, you've gone too far. You guys think you're holy. You guys think you should be the priest alone. All the people of God are holy. We should be priests. Moses goes, hey, we'll let God decide. And the next day, the 250 people who were like, we want the job, have been removed from that possibility forever. And the little golden bowls that they made offerings in have been hammered into a sheet and nailed to the altar, affixed to the altar as a reminder to everybody else who ever brings a sacrifice, God has chosen who he wanted as the priest. Now here's what's crazy. Because Korah had, part of his complaint was, you led us up out of the promised land. You led us up out of a land of milk and honey. We were ready to go in, which isn't true. So they're blaming, they're blaming their wilderness wandering on, on Moses. So Moses goes over to these two other guys. There was Korah, there was Dathan, and there was Abram. And he goes over to these other two guys, Dathan and Abram. He stands in front of their tents. And he tells them to come out. And they come out and they stand outside. I remember this story vividly from being a kid. I remember the, uh, the art for it. They had a poster of this story um, up on the wall in our Sunday school room. This is the story where the ground opens up and swallows some people whole. And I just remember going, wow. I wasn't terrified. I wasn't scared. I knew I was a Christian. I didn't fear that the ground was going to open up and swallow me. But I thought, man, that is awesome. Like it was just a crazy story. And so Moses comes out to the tents of Dathan and Abram. And he goes, look, he goes, you think that I've done this against you. You think that I'm the one who's caused all this to happen. He goes, so that we can know that this is of the Lord. He goes, if you die like any old man dies, we'll know it wasn't of God. But if something new happens and the ground opens up and swallows you whole, we'll know that this was from God and not from me. And at that moment, the ground opens up, people fall in and the ground shuts back over them and the households, not just Dathan and Abram, their entire households, their families, everything they owned fall into it and the pit closes over it and people start scattering, they're running, as you can imagine they might, and they're like, man, the ground's going to swallow us up too. So here's what you've had. Korah, Dathan, and Abram, who said, Moses and Aaron, you've gone too far. You've taken too much advantage of your authority. We want to be in charge. And Moses goes, let's let God pick. Right? 250 people are burned up. Another two families are consumed by the ground. And the people are fleeing. And you think that that would quell the complaints against Moses and Aaron. But if you keep reading chapter 16, it says, and the next day, the crowds came to Moses and are grumbling against him about what happened to Korah the day before. I want you to think about that. The people fleeing because they're afraid that the ground might swallow them up too. The people who saw that yesterday, today, are right where Korah and Dathan and Abram were the day before making the same complaint. I, I, feel like, I feel like that might last just a little bit longer in my mind, don't you? Don't you think that that like, would endure in your memory a little bit more? I'll tell you a story that only the kids in here will probably appreciate. But I was in fourth grade and in PE, and our coach told us when we were running around the soccer field, he said, run in a single file line. There was a, a place where, I mean, it wasn't a path, but it was where the dirt had been worn down, right? The grass had been worn down. You could see kind of the line where you were running around this field. And he would say, run in a single file line. And inevitably, what would happen is this guy would be running and this guy would kind of step like this, you know, to kind of see. And then this guy would step like this to kind of see. And what happened is about eight guys in front of me, I start seeing them do that. And what they didn't see was the pull-up bars that were running this way. And one guy running full speed steps right this into a pole, lays them out cold on the ground, busted a vein in his head and the blood with his heartbeat is going out. And all of us fourth grade boys are like, whoa, that was crazy. And I have never forgotten that. 35 years ago, and it is seared into my mind. 
And these people watch the ground split open, have seen the fiery uh, ashes of Korah and his 250 followers, have seen the ground split open and swallow Dathan and Abram, and they're like, man, we're good. Moses, you and us, we're okay. We agree. Whatever, you're in charge. And the next day they go, you know what? We've thought about it. We've had a night to sleep on it. And we think Korah and Dathan and Abram were correct. They come straight up to the tent of meeting, and then the Bible says that God sent a plague. And Moses says to Aaron, go and get the incense. And Moses runs back in to the tent of meeting, comes back out with an incense offering, and runs into the middle of the crowd to stop the plague. Here's the picture the Bible paints that people began to fall dead. And Aaron runs into the midst of the crowd and inserts this incense offering into the midst of the crowd to stop the plague right there, but not before 14,000 people have died. The day before, a few hundred. The day before, people were like, whoa, we're good. (laughs) Okay, got it. And then the next day, 14,000 more, dead. It is a crazy story. Very interesting. I always wonder, like, as Aaron's running, this is my funny side of my brain thinking about it, as Aaron's running with the incense, and you see people falling over, you know, and you're, like, kind of, like, moving over. You want to make sure that Aaron gets on the correct side of you so you aren't one of the ones that dies. I don't know if they had that thought or not. But 14,000 people left dead that day because they grumbled against, ultimately, God. Now, here's what we do. We get up and we teach that text, and because we, we want to, in our hearts, make every text about us, we say, whose authority are you not accepting? Who has God put an authority over your life that you're not accepting as an authority? That's the kind of stuff we do. And then we try to, like, guilt people into identifying with Korah or Dathan or Abram or the 14,000. Wh- whose authority are you not listening to? That's not the text. That's not what the text is about. It's about Korah, whose sons didn't die, by the way. We know that at the end of Numbers, when they do another census and they count everybody, Korah's sons didn't die. Korah's sons were not as wicked as their father. In fact, 15 of the Psalms that are written are written by Korah's sons. Korah's sons didn't follow their father into the rebellion. But but here's what we learn from a text like that, that... um, probably appeals to the fourth grade boy and and guys like me because there's so much going on in that one short chapter. But here's what we learn from it. We don't learn from it that be careful that you're not a Korah. That's not what we're learning from it. What we learn from it is that God had, had anointed specifically Aaron, had chosen Aaron as his priest, had chosen Aaron and Aaron's descendants to come in and out before the Lord in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting to make offerings on behalf of the people. And if anything, if anything, if you draw anything away from it, here's what you draw away from it, and let me prove it to you. What you draw away from it is, we have a better high priest than Aaron. His name is Jesus. And Jesus did not enter in to the tent of meeting. Jesus entered into the presence of God. And Jesus didn't go into the presence of God with the blood of goats and bulls last week. Saying it better this week. If you weren't here last week, it was a lot of boats and ghouls and stuff like that. But Jesus didn't go into heaven by the blood of goats and bulls. Jesus went into heaven by his own blood. Our priest is better. Our priest is better than the priest of Aaron. And hear me say this. The way the Bible talks about Korah's rebellion, you'll find it in Jude. The way the Bible talks about Korah's rebellion is like false teachers, People who deny Christ. The, the, the text here, the text here isn't, isn't human authority. That's, that's, not the, that's not the parallel to draw. The parallel to draw is don't deny the priest of God. And we're not talking for you and I. We're not talking about Aaron. We're talking about Jesus. Does that make sense? Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the one who has gone... In, like, do you, Korah and those people were destroyed not because they had a problem with authority. 
but because they rejected the priesthood of God. I am not the priest of God. And yet, when we teach stuff like number 16, it typically gets taught as, who's in authority over you? Is it your boss? You having trouble with your boss at work? Remember that God put your boss in work there. Don't be Korah. That's how they teach it. It's so shallow, because that's not the text. But you know what I can say to you? I can say to you, do not reject God's anointed one. I can say to you, do not reject Jesus, the high priest. I can say to you, do not think lightly of the authority of Jesus Christ. Because those who would teach you to think lightly of Jesus, the Bible says, are like Korah in his rebellion, false teachers, waterless, waterless clouds, springs without waters. What we try to do is we try to take every Old Testament text. I'm not saying that we all do this. Let me say it differently. The temptation for me, maybe for none of you, the temptation for me in my youth was to read a text like this and to find as quickly as I could a way that I could make some sort of an application to your pertinent circumstances. I would say to you students, you're under the authority of your instructors. I would say to you uh, people who work in the workforce, you're under the authority of your bosses. I would say wives, you're under the authority of your husbands. I would say we're all under the authority of our government. I would say, and here you're under the authority of the elders. And I would say those kinds of things, trying to guilt you into not behaving like Korah. But that's not the context. Does that make a little bit of sense? The context is always going to be Christ-centric and not human-centric. So here's what I'll tell you. Aaron interceded on behalf of the people because the people weren't allowed to come in before God. Christ interceded on our behalf so that we could come in before God. It's a better priesthood, agreed? If you're under the law, you don't ever get to come into the presence of God. If you are under grace because of Christ, you do get to come into the presence of God. The Levites were set apart as God's holy, consecrated people by the Old Testament law. By the New Testament gospel, we who have put faith in Jesus are called the holy and chosen ones. We are called the saints. Does that make sense? And we have a high priest, Jesus, who made a sacrifice of himself on our behalf. Don't reject that priest. Don't undermine his authority. That matters, doesn't it? In chapter 17, the people are still grumbling about how can we know who's gonna be the priest? And so Moses says this. You would think 15,000 people nearly dead between the previous couple of days. You would think that they'd be okay. They're still grumbling about how to figure out who's gonna be in charge. So Moses says, everybody pick one leader from each tribe and have them bring a, their staff, their walking staff, and we'll put it in the presence of the Lord. Write your name on it so we'll know whose is whose. I imagine that most sticks look the same. Write your name on it so we'll know whose is whose. Aaron puts his staff in the presence of the Lord along with the other one from each of the other 12 tribes. They put their staff before the Lord and the next day when they come in, Aaron's staff has put forth branches and leaves and flowers and ripe almonds in the course of an evening. At that point, the people go, we got it now. Why that had more of an impact than the people who have died the previous few days, I don't know. But now they get it. Okay, Aaron's in charge. We believe it. We accept it. So look at chapter 18. So now having decided who's in charge, chapter 18 is gonna address the rest of the Levites and say, here's what you get to do. You're not the priest. You're not the people in charge. Here's what your life is gonna be like. Here's what your responsibilities are. And then chapter 19 talks about the, the red heifer. It is, I don't know. I, I will just say this. I don't know that I have yet enjoyed Numbers chapter 19. It just, I try to focus on it <laughs> and read it and dive into it and glean from it, but here's the basics of it. 
pick an unblemished red heifer, burn that sucker up, and use the ashes of that heifer to help purify people. They'd mix it in with the water. It was the water of purification. And you would drink the water of purification. And so I want you to think about this for a minute, right? Remember, back in chapter 15, unintentional sin, here are the kinds of offerings you need to bring. Intentional sin, you're out. You're done. But now we've also got the ashes of the red heifer. And if you're unclean in any way, we're going to offer you a drink with some of these ashes in it so that you can be clean. Man, aren't you grateful that we don't live under the law? I can't imagine of myself that there would be a single day that went by that I wouldn't have to be offering some sort of offering, some sort of sacrifice at the tent of meeting. I can't imagine a single day of my life where I wouldn't have to be doing a sin offering or a guilt offering or a grain offering or a free will offering or drinking the water of purification. Every day. That was the law. It was the standard of the law. But you and I, we're in Christ. We are clean. We are holy. We are righteous. I get it that some of you don't feel that way sometimes. You look at your life and the temptation is like, man, I need to do something. Even the people in the Old Testament, they had to do something if they sinned. You ever felt that tension before? Like, what do I need to do to fix this? Even the people in the Bible had to do something. What do I need to do? Anybody ever felt that way? Look at this. Let me show you something. Uh, Look at, hold on, let me find it. Look at the end of chapter 15. Very end of chapter 15, verse 38. Speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corner of their garments. Throughout their generations, they shall put on the tassel, put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord's so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you have played the harlot, so that you will remember to do all of my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So get this. This was the fashion statement for the people under the law. So that they could remember the commands of the Lord. They would put tassels on the corner of their garments, the corner of their, their, uh, what, their clothes. They would have these blue Uh, cords with tassels on the end. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what color the tassels are, right? Here's what's interesting. A couple of things. I'll give you uh, a rebuke of Jesus in the New Testament about the Pharisees who enlarged their phylacteries, these boxes that they would wear around their heads with scriptures in them. They would enlarge those. They'd get these really big ones to show everybody how much Bible they, they knew, right? Or, you know, how important they were. And then they would lengthen, the Bible says, their tassels, Where does that come from? When Jesus rebukes the people in the New Testament about lengthening their tassels, that's coming from right here, Numbers 15. Where are these tassels so that you can always remember to observe my commandments? Here we go. I was about 20, and I had a couple of guys that were really good friends of mine, still are really good friends of mine, and uh, they were 19. Uh, All three of them were 19. I was 20. I was a year ahead of them in college. And we would get together once a week. We'd hang out all the time, but we'd get together once a week just to kind of hold each other accountable. It was always the same thing. Don't look at pornography. It was always the same thing. That was our one issue that we were keeping each other accountable for. Apparently, we thought everything else was golden. Uh, But that was the only thing we were checking with each other, you know? Like, nothing else seemed to matter. And so, because I grew up in church, and because I love the Bible, and because I was always trying to make the Old Testament be a model for New Testament living, one night, one night, before our meeting the next day, I thought, we need tassels. And so I went to whatever cloth world or whatever it was back then. I don't know if Hobby Lobby was around 24 years ago, but we, I went to whatever store there was, and I got blue cords Because that part was specified, right? Put the tassels on blue cords. And I got these blue cords, and then I looked for tassels. You can buy tassels. They come in all sorts of colors. And so I went through these tassels debating about which colors would be the best to represent the commandments of God. I mean, right, of course, do you remember as a kid, uh, I'm, I'm dating myself with this one a little bit, but do you remember sharing the gospel with a little book with no words? And it would be a little black piece of paper, 
and then a little red piece of paper, and you'd say, all of us are black with sin. And the same thing people did with beads later on their wrists. And, and so, so I'm going through all these, okay, I, you know, gold would be like heaven, and think, okay, I finally decided on red and white. The blood of Jesus makes us clean. It sounds really good, right? And so the next day, I went to my guys. The other, there were three of them. I went to them. I gave them these blue cords with these tassels on them, and we all hung them on our rearview mirrors for like the next, you know, forever. As a reminder, right, we need tassels as a reminder to observe the commandments of God. 20-year-old me thought, man, I have nailed it. But the next week, there had not been a decrease in anybody's pornography consumption. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? Why? Because the law and the tassels and the sacrifices cannot make anyone clean. They can't. Christ makes us clean. Christ makes us holy. Christ makes us righteous. Christ brings an end to the power of sin in our life. Christ sets us free. Not tassels hanging around my rearview mirror. I mean, maybe you want to take point with me and just say you didn't put them on the corners of your garments. Maybe that would have fixed it. I also read diligently the anointing oil recipe in the scripture. I had cinnamon in the cabinet. I didn't have the right kind of oil, but I had oil. And so some of the spices, I weren't, wasn't exactly sure what they were. I just did the best I could. And now I had my version of the anointing oil. So I had my anointing oil for myself, and I had my tassels on my rearview mirror. I was going to be okay. I was going to uphold the law. Except for 20-year-old me wouldn't catch on for another 20 years that my righteousness has never been dependent upon the law, but has always been dependent upon Christ. Please tell me that you understand that, that your righteousness is dependent upon Jesus. And here's, here's why that matters. Here's why it matters that we understand numbers, and, and here's why it matters that we read Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's... It, when Hebrews tells us that the old covenant of the law is fading away, when Hebrews tells us that the old covenant of the law is powerless, we need to be familiar with that so that we can say, here's what's powerless. Here's what doesn't work. Because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll keep leaning on the law instead of leaning on Christ. If we're not careful, we'll forget that the law failed, that the law was powerless, that the law couldn't save, that the law couldn't make anyone righteous, and we'll come up with some new rules. Okay, we're not Jews, we don't live by the Jewish law, but here's the Baptist rules, or here's the Christian rules, or here's the rules that you need to be a good believer in, in the United States. Here's the new list. Instead of saying, my righteousness depends upon Jesus. When you read the Old Testament, Hopefully, hopefully, you're not the fool that I was. And you don't get tricked into Numbers 15 and making new tassels for your garments. Hopefully, you don't adopt the law as some version of righteousness. Hopefully, you remember that even the people in the Old Testament, as Romans 4 tells us, were saved by their faith. Salvation is always dependent upon faith. It is never dependent upon our works. It has always depended upon the work of Jesus. Always. That's where righteousness lives. That's where holiness dwells. You and I have been anointed not by some oil, but by Jesus, by his blood, by his death, by his resurrection. That's where life dwells. We're reading, here, here's, here's, why you, we, uh, here's why I hope that we can understand Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Because we're going to see in Joshua and Judges that the people fail to uphold 
Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I mean, they fail. And then we're going to see in the kings that the people will have kings who lead them back to loving the Lord, and then they'll have kings that lead them away from loving the Lord. And then we're going to read in the prophets that the people have rejected God completely and turned to idols. And all of this, God is bringing judgment upon them and condemnation upon them because they have not held to the standard of the law. And then, like we said a few weeks ago, and then when everybody is at their lowest and they say, we can't do it, we've been idolaters, we can't uphold the law, where is life, where is hope? Then, then enter Jesus. The one who was born to bring life and salvation to humanity. Micah asked us while he was leading us in worship to contemplate the grace of God and to either thank him for the grace that we've experienced this week or to pray that we would be more aware of his grace, that we would comprehend it. I hope that by the time we're done going through the Old Testament, I hope that you will be so overwhelmed by the grace of God (laughs) that you'll be so enamored with the richness of his kindness towards us and that he has redeemed us not by a standard of our works but by a standard of of his. I hope that you'll read texts like Numbers and Korah's Rebellion and that instead of immediately trying to make it be a text about us, that you would make it a text as it is about people under the law. And then rejoice that that's not us that we're in Christ, holy and blameless, without stain or blemish or any such thing. I hope that if you have questions that you'll talk to us, you'll come to fellowship on Thursdays or Bible study on Tuesdays, but don't leave your questions unchecked. That's what we're here for. We're a body doing this together, seeking to understand uh, God more fully and enjoy him more fully. So, Bring it on, right? Like this is, we're doing this together. I will not make you any tassels, okay? I will point you to Christ. That's probably the thing that I regret most is that in my early years of preaching, I pointed things, I pointed people to a lot of things other than Jesus. Now I only want one thing. <laughs> I want people to know the richness of Jesus. That's what I want. And that's what I hope to point people to because in Christ is life. I've said that about a dozen times, but in Christ is life. Let me pray for you guys. Lord God, how good and beautiful and true it is that in Christ we have life. Not in my works, not in the works of Moses or Aaron, not in the summation of all the things that I've done through my years of church attendance. But Lord, that my righteousness, my life, my hope, my glory, my holiness rests firmly on Jesus Christ. Be the joy of our hearts and the boast of our lips and draw us further into your presence. It's in your name we pray, amen.